all I could see was the Earth beneath me wow. because the space station was behind me and I'm on the end of the fully extended robotic arm. The view was absolutely unbelievable. You're looking back at the planet and you can see the horizon of the Earth and the black infinite void of space. And you realize there's no lines separating countries on Earth. And in fact, we're all in this together. It was truly incredible being able to do it. Dr. Williams, first I'd like to thank you for coming out on what is a pretty special day in your life, yeah. your birthday. Yes. Happy birthday. Thank you very much. And taking the time out to come here and, and talk to us about not just watches, but your entire life story. Well, thanks very much for coming. It's actually, I'm really thrilled to be here today. And the story is not just about the watches, but thanks for coming out from New York to Warplane Heritage. It's a place where we make aviation come alive. You can feel the magic of aviation here because we're looking at Canada's largest collection of flying warbirds. All these vintage aircraft. And what we're hoping, we're hoping that seven-year-olds, eight-year-olds, 10-year-olds, whatever age they are, come to the museum and capture, ignite their dreams of becoming a pilot or their passion for aviation. You, you grew up in Quebec became a doctor. How did that lead into being selected by the CSA? I was lucky in the sense that uh, I was already in clinical practice. I was the director of the emergency department at Sunnybrook Hospital in Toronto, but did all my training in uh, McGill University in Montreal. So when the agency was looking for astronauts in 1992, it turns out we need different categories of astronauts. There's always going to be experimental test pilot astronauts. There will be engineers and things. We also need doctors in space, mm. particularly if you're going to be sending humans on board the space station for right. six month, one year missions. And now we're looking to the future of sending humans back to the moon and ultimately onto Mars. So I think for me, it was the fact that I was a practicing doctor. I'd been a research scientist. I was also a pilot. I'd also done skydiving. I was a scuba diving instructor. So it was a blend of all those mm. different things that led me to being selected. Flew in space the first time in 1998, and my second space flight was in 2007, where I had a chance to ride on the Canada Arm and help build the space station. So it's been an incredible journey, yeah. you know, going from being a little kid with a dream about flying in space to becoming a pilot, a doctor, ultimately flying in space, and then leaving all that to actually become a hospital CEO. So a few of these watches have been both to the bottom of the ocean and to space. Yeah. What watch? was the first watch you were given? So the first watch that I was given was uh, the Seiko, and uh, I was given this on my 21st birthday. So my goodness, that was 44 years ago today. And that's, wow. to me, it's really special because I, of course, remember opening this up. And in those days, I was a scuba diver, scuba diving instructor, and this was a fantastic watch for me. It replaced my original diving watch. And, you know, there's great memories that take me back to my 21st birthday, but also this watch flew in space with me on STS-90. I've used it extensively underwater as a diver and had it on the Aquarius Undersea Research Habitat with me as well. So it's a lot of history, a lot of great memories, and it's a great watch. You know, to me, a watch is uh, a piece of equipment that I use in all the various things that I do. So whether it's diving, flying, or flying in space, the watch has to be reliable, has to perform its functions, and this one has done a stellar job for me over the years. And it, it was great having it with me on the missions. There's nothing quite like being in space. And my father had passed away in 1976, so he never saw me become an astronaut. And I'm in space doing all these complex, demanding tasks. I look at the watch and I'd remember my father and my mother and when they gave it to me. And there's something about, you know, having your family there with you that helps you in these missions perform the complex tasks. And, right make sure that you're uh, not messing up and making oh, mistakes. Yeah. So that's not the only watch that has been in space. No. What else was on your first mission? So this watch is particularly special, the Rolex, and I flew that on both my first and my second space flight. It's been on my Aquarius undersea missions. I did two undersea missions. 
The reason why it's so special is this is the diving watch that my father bought for himself when I started to dive in 1967. And for medical reasons, my father didn't actually participate in scuba diving, but he was there every time I went diving, as you can mm -hmm. imagine when your 13-year-old son is going out diving wow. in the ocean. You want to make sure that things are going well. So there's again a lot of great memories uh, associated with this watch. And uh, you know, today I look at this watch and I think of my father. Mm -hmm. And it brings back those memories. In fact, I'm wearing his signet ring as well. And it's one of the interesting things about these is that there's a history that mm -hmm. begins to emerge. And you know, when I hand this watch off to either my son or my daughter, then you wonder what that history and the continuity will be. And, what they will be doing with it as well. But it's a spectacular watch. The Rolex is great. And on my second space flight, I did fly another Submariner that belonged to uh, Dr. Joe McGinnis. Mm -hmm. And Joe is Canada's famous diving doctor. He didn't get the same profile that Jacques Cousteau did, but certainly in Canada, he was a preeminent figure and he became one of my role models and one of my heroes. So I first met Joe in 2001 underwater on wow. my first undersea mission. And we're living on Aquarius and we're diving on the reef and we come over one of the rises in the reef and there's Joe McGinnis diving and we were writing little notes to each other and things. So anyway, after 2001, Joe and I became very good friends. And in uh, my second space flight in 2007, we were in crew quarters just about to lift off to go into space and we're having lunch and we're looking at the ocean and how amazing it is being able to explore inner space and outer space. And I look at Joe he's got his Rolex on. Mm. He said, Joe, like, isn't that the Rolex that you used when you went to Titanic with James Cameron? Yeah. He says, yeah, I, this is the only Rolex in the world that's been to Titanic. Wow. He said, I think we should take it to the space station. And Joe says, can you do that? Yeah, why not? <laughs> so I put it on my wrist and I actually wore it when I lifted off to go into space. And it was pretty exciting taking that watch with me recognizing what it meant from the depths of the mm -hmm. ocean exploring Titanic to going to the International Space Station. Needless to say, Joe was pretty happy when I oh, gave yeah. it back to him after the mission. So, let's get down to the nitty gritty and talk about this guy here, the Omega X-33. This watch was flown on your first mission, and that might have been one of the first missions that the X-33 was involved with, is mm -hmm. that right? This watch actually uh, flew with me on my second flight because I had mm. to give back the one that flew with me on my first flight. But the first time I flew on STS-90 in 1998, the X-33 had just been released. Mm -hmm. And we actually flew a prototype version of this watch that was not available to the public and it was the first time astronauts were flying the watch. And Omega wanted our comments and feedback on the design of the watch, the functionality of the watch and things. So needless to say, we were pretty excited to be able to do that. The only difference between the version that we flew on my first space flight and this one, which was uh, subsequently flew in space, was the design of the buttons on the side. They were circular, they were smaller. They're a little trickier to use than these ones. These ones have been redesigned and are fantastic. They're mm -hmm. larger and it's easy to push the buttons and things. But it was a fantastic watch and it was also fun evaluating it and giving feedback on how the watch performed in space. And needless to say, it performed flawlessly. Right. There was no single watch up until that point that would do everything that we needed a watch mm -hmm. to do in space. So many people ask, what time zone do you use when you're in space? Yeah. Well, you know, on the space shuttle, we would track central time because, of course, mission control is in Houston, mm -hmm. so we need to know what time it is in Houston. You generally also track whatever time zone your family's in because you want to know whether it's day or night or what's going on with your family. So in my case, although our family lived in Houston, my mother was living to south of Ottawa at the time. So we were tracking the Eastern time zone. Then we're tracking GMT, which of mm -hmm. course is the aviation standard. And then we also track MET, which is mission elapsed time. Right. And it's essentially a count up clock that starts the minute you lift off. So you would have all these time zones that you would have to track. And this is the one watch that could do it for us. Right. In addition to being a stopwatch and having alarm functions and things. So an incredible watch. Do you remember the moment when the rocket engines are firing up behind you, you're sitting there, everything's vibrating. Do you remember the moment of actually pushing the chronograph button to start? <laughs> it was pretty remarkable. I have to tell you that you zip by that pretty quickly because right. you know when, when the solid rocket boosters kick in and everything is shaking back and forth, you know, it's, it's a pretty spectacular moment to be able to do that. But the funny part about launch is in the T-minus two minute window. 
is that T-minus two minutes, it's the last thing you do before you lift off is you close the visor of your spacesuit, you turn the oxygen on, and then you have to wait right. two minutes. There's really nothing to do. And on my first space flight, I was one of the flight engineers on the flight deck, so I had to turn on the cockpit voice recorder and check that. So I had roughly a little over a minute to just sit there and think about what's going to happen. I remember lying on my back looking out the overhead window and it's this beautiful blue day and oh it's going to be fantastic for our guests and then T minus 30 seconds you hear the call in your headset. You're thinking in 30 seconds I'm going to lift off into space but it was at T minus 15 seconds I had this huge reality check okay. that I'm going to be sitting on top of essentially a controlled explosion right. and going from being stationary to traveling 25 times the speed of sound in eight and a half minutes. And that actually got my attention. That was a little scary because, you know, we all know the catastrophic things that can happen. Mm -hmm. So by the time my brain processed all that information, it was T minus 6.6 .6 seconds. Main engines ignited, you're shaking back and forth, and the solids kick in, and you're going for the ride of a lifetime. Wow. And do you wear it often these days? Uh, these days, so my go-to watch is either my Breitling, which I'm wearing right now, mm -hmm. or the Omega. And the Breitling, this one flew with me on uh, STS-118. This has not been to the Aquarius Undersea Research Habitat. Breitling B-1, it was a present from my wife, who's mm -hmm. a commercial airline pilot and is currently a captain with Air Canada flying the 787. So this, uh, this is a uh, go-to watch and then this is my other go-to watch. You can feel the difference in weight between oh, that yeah. and the titanium with the X-33. Totally different. Yeah. And. Let's talk about this guy right here. So this is a dress watch, and I understand it was worn by your father as well. Yes, yeah. So they say, you know, for every watch there's a purpose, mm -hmm. and um, my father, uh, who, you know, mountain climber, explorer type, was a bank manager, and he used to wear that watch when he was going out to special functions. So the only time I wear that watch is at a black tie event. And I've been very fortunate throughout my life, primarily as an astronaut, to have been at a number of black tie right. events. So the most recent event, was at the Explorers Club when we were getting together to celebrate the achievements of the Apollo astronauts. And right. uh, I had no idea that they were going to call on the shuttle astronauts that were there to get up on stage with the Apollo astronauts and give the Apollo astronauts their awards. But uh, again, very special memories associated with that watch. So, you know, I, whenever I look at that watch, not only will I remember my father, but uh, I'll remember standing on stage giving Walt Cunningham an award for the incredible things that they did on their mission. Yeah, that's very special. And then we have this Seiko chronograph right here. Yeah. What's the story behind this guy? So that guy, my wife gave it to me when I started flying again in the 1980s. And uh, I started flying in 1971, ran out of money. So I stopped flying in 1971, met my wife in 1979, and she said, that she had wanted to be a pilot, but she was told in high school she couldn't because mm. she was female. And uh, that set her mind that not only did she want to be a pilot, but now she was totally committed to making sure she was going to be a pilot because somebody actually told her that. So she started her flight training in 1979, and I was in medical school at the time, and I graduated, became a practicing physician. Well, she finished her flight training and became a pilot with Air Canada. So I started flying again yeah. around 1988. And when I started flying again, she gave me that watch to kind of commemorate the moment of getting back into aviation. Wow. And at one point, she was uh, my flight instructor, which worked out really well. Yeah, you know, you kind of wonder, how's that going to work for yeah. you, flying with your spouse as your instructor? But she was fantastic. She's a great pilot and, again, lots of great memories. So when I had that one with me in space on my first space flight, it brought back a lot of memories. Oh, yeah. I have to ask, you have done a number of EVAs. Yes. What did you wear? But more importantly, how did you feel? Yeah, the spacewalks were absolutely incredible. You know, it's the ultimate sense of freedom. One of the most remarkable moments for me was on my second spacewalk where I was riding on the end of the Canada arm. Mm -hmm. It was a very proud moment for oh, yeah. a Canadian astronaut, as you can imagine. But the Canada arm was pointing straight after the space station, and uh, Charlie Hobaugh, the operator of the Canada arm at the time, said, Dave, you're going to have to take a couple minutes and enjoy the view because I have to reprogram the arm. So oh, that's going to be really tough for me to do. <laughs> All I could see was the Earth beneath me wow. because the space station was behind me, and I'm on the end of the fully extended robotic arm. The view was absolutely unbelievable. 
you're looking back at the planet and you can see the horizon of the earth and the black infinite void of space. You realize there's no lines separating countries mm -hmm. on earth. In fact, we're all in this together. It was truly incredible being able to do it. So as a person who's been to the bottom of the ocean and to the ISS, theoretically, a watch is just as important as the hatch in the airlock or, or any bit of mechanical tooling that contributes to the mission. But what makes watches different and special? You know, every one of these watches has got a specific purpose. And what makes them special is the fact that for the watch to perform flawlessly is critical. We have a passion for precision. We have a passion for performance that enables us to do what we do in space. So my life depends on these watches functioning flawlessly. You know, if I'm outside diving, let's say, and I'm looking at the time that I've been in the water and I'm trying to determine my decompression time, having a diving watch that functions flawlessly is absolutely critical. And when you're in space, needless to say, it's the same thing. We've got a number of critical functions that we might be doing. You know, with the X33, the great thing about this watch, same thing with the Breitling, is that we've got countdown timers, we've got count up timers mm -hmm. that are in there as well. So if we're performing a specific task, in fact, on STS-90, many times I would take this watch and I'd have it on the uh, rack beside me with a countdown timer set up that I would engage to enable me to perform my task and remind me of critical things that mm -hmm. had to be done. So for me, these are not only are they memories and they bring out very strong emotions and great memories and things, they're tools. Right. And I would not be here today if these watches did not perform right. accurately. So for someone like me and, and the rest of us Earthlings, what was the most surprising thing that happened, either training to go to space or in space? What was the point where there was a shift in worldview or a shift in the way you looked at things? Or what, how did you transform? There's so many things that happen in space that are unique to the environment of space, but more importantly, there's a couple of things that directly address your question that took place during the spacewalks. So my last spacewalk, I was outside with Clay Anderson, amazing person to do spacewalk was, and we're 20 minutes into the spacewalk, and all of a sudden we hear the fire alarm go off in the space station. Wow. And yet there's no way you can really train for that, you know, right. I mean, it just, it happens, and yes, we are trained, and we know what to do in things, but when you're actually out there in the moment, it certainly gets your attention. So I remember looking at Clay and we kind of shrug our shoulders and <laughs> well, we're outside and you know, they'll figure it out. Turns out it was a false alarm. But there are those moments where you, know, uh, you resort to your training and your backup and then they're confronted with the stark contrast of the broader philosophical moments where you look back at the planet and you see this amazingly beautiful planet. I remember thinking about my life in the sense of cosmic time. So, you know, I'm 65 today, and hopefully I'll live into my 90s and things, but, you know, 90 years old relative to a four and a half billion year old planet, I, it's kind of like being think, a, right. a little drop of sand on an infinite beach, you know, right. which seems a little depressing at times. And I remember thinking about that when I was doing a spacewalk, and then I realized that, you know, rather than think about this as depressing, think about the opportunities yeah. that we all have to live life to the fullest.